Hey there, and welcome. It's good to have you with me today. It would be fun to get to know each other just a little bit before we dive into the meat of what we're going to be covering tonight. today. I would love to know where you're from. And I just need to check. I am unmuted. Why is it saying I'm muted? There we go. I would love to know where you're from. This'll, this is going to be an interactive webinar, not just me spewing information out at you. And so let's have you find that chat box and let's have you have an experience with that chat box just to let me know where on the face of the planet you are at right now. You'll find that the more you interact with me, the more you'll get from me. Your interaction really fuels my enthusiasm. Amy, I see you've got your hand up. Can you find your chat box? Amy, I'm just gonna unmute you here for a minute. Yeah, hi, Amy. Hi, um, it's disabled. It says my chat is disabled. Oh my goodness, that's weird because I just I've enabled it. Um, okay. Just just a minute. No, 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 no. You are absolutely right. There we go. Now it should be enabled. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me know. Uh huh. Okay, Amy's from Missouri. Ooh, welcome from Missouri. That is so good, so good. Where else? And we've got Milton, Ontario, fantastic. So good. Okay. And there we go. Where else do we have? We've got a few more people with us. We're always a small group. Because when you think about iridology and you think about iridology for practitioners, well, practitioners narrows it down to a small group. And then those that are interested in iridology is even smaller. So love to know where you're from. While you're weighing in on that, um, again, just feel free to post comments and questions in the chat box. If I can work the, the answers to the questions into the presentation, I will. And I do want to put your minds at ease. You saw the posts and things like that that said, I'm not selling anything here. This is not a high pressure sales type of thing. This is an opportunity for us to get to know each other and to look a little bit at iridology and then to introduce you to the dynamic iridology program and for us to maybe work from there. And we've got Liz from New Jersey. Hi, Liz. Good to have you with us. So good. So good. All right, so, you know, when I am working with new people, people that I haven't maybe worked with too much before, and they, I'm talking with them to help, help me understand why they might be wanting to look at iridology, what I found is that they primarily are looking for a low invasive way or a non-invasive way to assess their clients. They've heard that they can use iridology to diagnose. We're gonna talk about that word in a few minutes. And they, but they want a way to assess their clients. Sometimes, sometimes the people I'm speaking with have learned iridology. They might've even been certified through some other channel, but they're finding it's not working for them. It's taking them a long time to write reports. They're not seeing what they think they should be seeing. They're not understanding what they're seeing. They, don't, they haven't been taught how to apply iridology in their clinical work. And there are some also who are just curious and they wanted to come to a meeting like this, to a presentation or a, an interaction like this, because it was a low commitment way for them to investigate iridology further. So those are the three most common things that I hear when I'm speaking with people. I'm, I'm curious. Is, is one of these your reason? And if it is, you can just say yes. You don't need to tell me which one it is. Or is there something else? Is there another reason why you're with me today? And if there's another reason, just give me another. And then if you want a private message that reason to me, I will do my best to make sure I address that 
of course, without using your name in our presentation. So it's one of these three reasons why you're here, yes. If yes, just give me a yes in the chat box. And if it's a no, then I would love it if you would send me a private message to let me know which one or what, what your reason for being here is. Okay, we've got some yeses. So I know I'm pointing in the right direction then. That's amazing, that is so good. So regardless of your reason for being here, you, if you've heard about iridology or maybe you've experienced iridology, um, you might be surprised to learn that iridology can save you hours in assessing your clients. And this is a really powerful thing for you to know. Um, it's when I teach iridology, I teach it at a professional level that will allow you to do a solid and appropriate iridology assessment with program creation. So deciding what to recommend to your client in 20 minutes. How does that sound? Does that sound like it might help you in your work if you could do the assessment and create a program in 20 minutes? Now, the beauty of the 20 minutes isn't that you're going to rush through and, and people are going to feel like don't let the door hit you on the behind when you're on your way out kind of fast. But it's more that if you typically work in 30 or 60 minute appointments, being able to do your assessment and your program creation in 20 minutes allows you 40 minutes to create rapport and to build rapport. A lot of our clients are looking for that. I don't know what the medical world is like where you live. Where I live, doctors actually have signs on the wall in the office saying, saying, limited to one question. If you've got two questions, you have to book another appointment and come back another day to get your second question answered. You know, doctors spend an average of about seven minutes with a patient. And most of the time, They've decided before they come into the room what the diagnosis will be. They look at the notes that the receptionist has made when you booked your appointment, and the doctor already knows what he's going to prescribe. People are craving connection. They are craving connection with their healthcare providers. Iridology allows us to do that. Because that extra 40 minutes, you're developing rapport, you're gathering more information, you're kind of fleshing out the story. And the bonus to this is the more rapport you build, the more likely it is your clients will come back and will send their friends to you. So this is so amazing, so amazing. Now, for some of you that have studied iridology and you find it's not working for you, this is something I take very seriously. If you've studied iridology and it's not working for you, it's not your fault. This is going to sound harsh. It's the truth. It's your teacher's fault. Right? I've had a lot of students who were previously certified by other instructors but they were only taught nuts and bolts. They were not taught how to actually use iridology. You know, they were taught, this is a wrench, that is a screwdriver, that is a screw, but they weren't taught what they could do with it. And so because of that, these students pass their class, they maybe are even certified. They knew enough of the, the theory to be able to pass an exam, but they didn't learn enough of the application to be able to use it. So now they feel like they failed. And they, they've studied a skill that they can't use easily and they are getting to where they don't want to use it and they, they just feel like they're stupid. Nothing could be further from the truth. The fact of the matter is anyone can teach you to recognize a marking. Not everyone will teach you how to use that marking. So I make sure that when I teach, I teach application because teaching application takes time that most teachers are not willing to invest. And I really want my students to know, number one, that I love them. Number two, that I want them to be successful. And so I'm going to teach them how to use this tool. Whoops, that skipped a slide. No, it didn't. 
So if this is you, if you're just curious and you wanted a low commitment way to investigate further, well, that's totally fair. That's totally fair. No one wants to get backed into a corner in a, in a meeting or in a workshop or anywhere where they feel like they're going to be high pressured into anything. Now, you know, I want you to think of today in a particular way. I'm going to give you a little story here. When I applied to go to university as a young adult, I applied to two schools and I got accepted to both of them. And the one that won out, they were both excellent schools. They, the tuition would have been probably cheaper at the second one than it was at the first one. I would have had great accommodation. It would have been a great experience in either school. But the one that won out was the one that invited me down for a weekend, like way early. It was like February of the year for a weekend to tour me around the campus and to run me through some extra honors testing to see, you know, what scholarships they might be able to offer me. And that's the school that won out because they let me sample what they had right now you should talk to your teacher the prospective teacher the one you're thinking of studying with you should get a sneak peek at how they teach or at the learning materials basically you should be having a tour of the campus and that's that might be exactly why you're here tonight so if that's your reason i'm really glad you're here again this is an interactive webinar and i really encourage you to drop comments and ask questions in the chat box I've got stuff I want to share with you um, about iridology and yes, about the course. And I, I hope you've got a pen and paper to write it down and, and, and to write down any questions you've got so that if I don't cover the questions you have, we can circle back to those and make sure we do them. I will do my best to fit your the answers to your questions into the presentation. Now, the facts of the matter are that iridology is a powerful assessment tool. And confidence is something that can be developed. It is my opinion that the teacher's job is yes, to teach the nuts and bolts and yes, to build the confidence, to help the student understand what they're doing and how to use it so that they feel confident at the end of the class. They might not feel as confident as they will after a few years of experience, but they need to feel confident enough that they can use what they've learned and use it well. So many of you, I do recognize many of the names here, have been with me on the weekly mini classes. So I'm gonna keep my introduction of myself really short because you already kind of know me. I'm Judith Cobb and I am one of only eight level three IPA certified iridology instructors in the world. Level three was added in 2021, I think, or was it 2022? It might've, it might've been, I don't remember. It's been a few years. And I was one of the first three to certify in that. I've been in the holistic health industry since 1981. Actually, I started studying and dabbling in it in 1979. But in 1981, I started coaching people. And I started teaching about herbs and nutrition. And um, I did that very early on in my practice because where I lived, there wasn't much information out there. You know, people would come to see me. They would book an appointment and come to see me sort of under cloak of darkness, nobody wanted to be seen going to the herbalist's house, right? Because back in the early 70s, this was really wing nutty. It really was. I was on the fringe there. And there wasn't a lot of information. So I started teaching. I started the journey, this whole journey for my own wellness. I was 20 years old. I had health problems. The doctors couldn't seem to sort it out. I was still in university at the time. I was studying to be a school teacher, but I ended up dropping out just two semesters before I graduated. Dropped out for two reasons. Number one, I got married. And number two, I realized I didn't like other people's kids well enough to spend all day with them. But I knew I loved teaching. And actually, teaching adults is where my heart is. And so that's why I'm here. That's why I ended up here. Over the years, I've self-published and written and self-published many books. They're all currently out of print, except for the textbook for the Dynamic Iridology course, which is an IPA-approved textbook, and it's an IPA-approved course. Now, here's the catch. My textbook is only available to my students because it's not in hard copy. It is a digital textbook, and I've done it that way specifically so that I could keep the information current and up to date. And as IPA tweaks the curriculum, I can adjust my, my textbook and we can stay in step. 
Um, over the years, I've also designed and taught courses about herbs, herbology, practical use of herbs, biokinesiology, color therapy. And for a while, I was a certified prenatal educator with the ICEA. That was a ton of fun. I still love doing prenatal work and fertility work and new mom kind of work. Still is another place where my heart lives. I'm also a nutrition professional and my credentials there allow me to be affiliated with the Canadian Association of Holistic Nutrition Professionals and the Canadian Association of Natural Nutrition Practitioners. I'm also a master herbalist, and I am a professional member of the Alberta Herbalist Association. And so what I want to do next, is I want to introduce you to one of my students really quickly. She is a CNHP. She graduated from, uh, I think it was Trinity College, and then she did my iridology program. And this is one of the things that she said. She had also attended, uh, this is a lot of what she said. So she had attended this re regenerative detox course where iridology is implemented. I spread the word about what a wonderful teacher you are. Most people I taught with did not have anywhere near the same experience with their iridology education. They had no support. They had unanswered questions and a lot of confusion. Mostly they finished their classes not knowing how to implement what they had learned. I feel so absolutely blessed to have been taught by you. I feel totally supported even still as I've graduated almost five years ago now. I don't think there's anyone out there practicing, educating, and teaching iridology like you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Then I asked her in, in our private group, I asked her, how has iridology, constitutional iridology helped you? She said, iridology has helped me to understand the relationships between different organs and organ systems more in depth. Iridology also gives me an advantage of seeing the potential for different genetic traits and qualities that may be underlying. By observing the constitution, for example, you can extrapolate how the person's body will likely respond to applications of healing methods. Therefore, it has helped me to expand my knowledge and increased efficiency at providing more precise recommendations for health oriented options. So, so amazing. So I'm inviting you after we talk about eyes for a few minutes here to stay with me till the end of the workshop to learn a little bit about the dynamic iridology assessment system course and, um, and work from there with me perhaps. So in order for us to understand what iridology is, I think it's important that we understand a little bit about where it came from and how it developed. It's been around for a millennia. There's evidence of it archeologically coming from Egypt, India, China, and Greece, but we know that science evolves. And as with many things scientific, so much of what was learned back then faded from view and became lost. And so we don't know everything they know, but we do know that it started to be rediscovered in the 1800s. Now, these are some of the different people who uh, contributed to theories, primarily theories about iridology. And I love what Rudolf Schnabel said. He said it was no easy task and those who would like to believe that handling iridology can be learned within a few weeks or even days are mistaken and do a disservice to a good cause. And I, I agree with him. I think it's a mistake to think you can learn this from a book I think it's a mistake that you can learn it from YouTube videos, even though I've got hundreds of them up. I think it's a mistake to think that you can learn this in a weekend. All you're going to learn is a few nuts and bolts. You're not going to learn the intricacies and the, the connecting the dots, the, the application of this. We have more researchers. Now, I love what Joseph Onger said because he knew that people were publishing iridology theories before they'd been proven, before they'd been tested. And that's where some of our misinformation comes from. Even now, some of the misinformation that's out there is because people have glommed onto those theories and they've been teaching them as if they're absolutely true and they're not, and they've been disproved, but they just won't go away because people don't like to change their minds about things. So we've got Joseph Deck and Theodore Kriega. More modernly, we've got Bernard Jensen, Harry Wolf, Bill Cardona. Bill Cardona was my face-to-face -face iridology, a, a constitutional iridology instructor. I studied under a first-generation Jensenian when I first began. And I practiced Jensenian iridology for about 10 years mm -hmm. before I decided this is not working. And that's when I was lucky enough to, to connect with Harry Wolf and Bill Cardona to study with them. 
Now, you're going to find that there are a lot of different types of iridology out there. There is Jensenian, there's Rayid, or some people call it emotional. There's another branch of that called behavioral, um, and there's constitutional. Now, in the interest of time, we are only going to focus on the Jensenian and the constitutional. I want to contrast those a little bit before we focus on constitutional. I'm suspecting that some of you have probably had some exposure to, exposure to Jensen because there's a lot of Jensenians out there. So Jensen, the Jensenian st style was originally taught by Bernard Jensen. We love Bernard. You, and you need to remember that. We absolutely adore him. He kept iridology alive in North America during the Cold War years. When all this research was continuing in Germany and Russia behind the Iron Curtain and in communist countries, primarily communist countries, um, Bernard took those theories that he learned and he worked with them and he kept that alive. He kept that base alive. And then when the Iron Curtain fell and information started coming over, it can, iridology continued to develop. Jensen taught that the iris changes when the body changes, that if you change the diet, if you add the right supplements, you're going to see what he called healing lines in the eyes. You would see what he called lesions. We call them lacunae, change shape and size. We're going to look at some, some eyes in a few minutes, so it'll make more sense if you don't know what those mean. Traditional Jensenian iridologists have often done iridology readings cold with no background information from the client. So you sit down across from them and look at your eyes. They tell you what's wrong. And then they send you to the front desk to buy your supplements and you never said a word. Right. Not exactly holistic, in my opinion. I do put my tongue in my cheek and I call this crystal ball iridology. Traditional Jensenian iridologists have a very different style from modern Jensenians. Uh, Bernard Jensen's daughter-in-law, who studied with Bernard for about four decades, about three and a half decades, has taken Bernard's information and has updated it to be more constitutional. It's still not purely constitutional, but it's much more constitutional. And so you'll find that there's a discrepancy there even between Jensenians, where some will say they follow Bernard Jensen and some will say Ellen Tart Jensen. And there's a lot of things that don't line up between the two of them. Constitutional iridology originated with Joseph Deck and a few of the other European researchers. It's actually used by medical doctors in Italy, Germany, and Russia. They use iridology as a screening tool. And in Germany, you have to be a medical doctor or a naturopath in order to study and use iridology. So they know something that we're kind of glad our doctors don't know. And I say that because if our doctors knew it, it would do us out of a job right? There are correlative medical studies being done. We've got research that proves or has disproved things so that we know what direction we're going in. And science will always continue to ask, no, let me rephrase that. Science should always continue to ask questions. Science is the art of asking questions. It's the art of asking questions and then testing to see what the answers are create a hypothesis, test the hypothesis. Did your hypothesis float or did it sink? And if it sank, then you start over. You change your hypothesis, you redesign the study and you come back at it from a different angle to see if you can prove a different facet of your hypothesis, right? Do you agree with me that science should keep developing and that research needs to be ongoing? If you do, give me research in the comments box. We know that the constitutional style of iridology also teaches that the eyes are a reflection of the genetic structure of the body. Now I want to add to that because in constitutional iridology, we look at the iris, the pupil and the sclera where the iris is genetic and it shows us what the genetic potentials are of the body. The sclera tells us mostly what's going on in the body right now with a little genetic influence. And the pupil also tells us a bit about what's going on with the spinal alignment and the nervous system and particular organs. Again, primarily what's going on now with a little bit of genetic influence. So there's so much information there that we need to correlate for each client. When you know how to do it, it's very, very quick. Constitutional iridology is the foundation of dynamic iridology. I love how Bill Caradonna taught me. You know, Bill and I are still in touch. He, I certified under him three decades ago. 
and we are still in touch. And I, I am grateful that he is still willing to answer my questions. I call them my 2 a.m. questions. One of the first things I learned from Bill was that the iridology does not give us answers. It tells us what questions to ask. So when we're looking at an iris and we're putting that beside the symptoms the client has brought to us, and because we understand anatomy and physiology, and we understand the iris, and we understand the sclera, we now know how the dots connect, and we now understand what questions we need to ask to get the deeper information to come up with the right kind of protocol. There are, uh, we know with constitutional iridology that other iris and sclera changes may continue to become visible with time, revealing areas that may need support. And we always want background information. We always want to have that conversation with our client. We want to create that rapport, but we more than that, we want to understand who our client is and how they're put together. I've been working with a gentleman. Uh, we've had about four appointments now over the past three months. And he came to me because his prostate was so inflamed he could no longer urinate. And it was obvious he needed medical attention, right? And he had gone that direction and he had a catheter when we first met. And then he did go for some other medical procedures. He went for steaming to take down the inflammation. So that was great. But every time he comes in, we'll be talking about something and he'll stop and he'll say, you know, I've been working with other herbalists for 40 years. All of his other herbalists have died or have retired or whatever. He says, I've been working with these herbalists for over 40 years. And every time I come in, you say something that hits the nail right on the head like nobody else has ever said to me before. So on this last appointment, uh, we were talking about, oh, I don't remember what it was exactly, but I said, we tied in some emotion. And I said to him, well, and I know a bit about his life and I know about where he's at in his life and in his career. And I said, well, the kidneys are about fear and especially about fear of money. And so you've had kidney stones in the past and you're concerned about developing kidney stones in the future. And, and, and I can understand why you would be afraid, but you need to deal with that because if you don't, it will go to your kidneys and you will develop kidney stones. And he went, Whoa, Whoa, no one's ever told me that before. Okay. Well, now you've heard it. Now, you know, you've got some emotional homework to do deal with the fear, deal with the fear. So we want that background information. It helps us to reach deeper into what our clients need. Let's take a little look at the eye, and then we're going to look at some eyeballs. You good with that? You want to look at some eyes in a minute? If you do, give me the word eyes in the comments box. That way I'll know that you want to look at some pictures of eyeballs. Okay. So when we look at an iris, we do look a little bit at the cornea because the cornea does give us information and the cornea does change over time. We look at the iris, which is our genetic connection to the body. And we look at the sclera. The sclera again tells us what's going on in the body now, it tells us where our hot spots are things that we need to be paying attention to. The interesting thing is that the sclera will often show indications before we have a clinical problem. Now, in saying that, I want you just to take a step back and to realize that when you see a sclera that has a lot of blood vessels in it, there's a lot of information there. The absolute worst thing you can do is to try to deal with all of it at once. Right? Does that make sense? You don't want to deal with all of it at once. You want to start with understanding what are my client's concerns? Why did my client come to see me? What do I see in the iris, the sclera, the cornea that give me information? And what questions do they want me to ask? And you stay laser focused on what the client has asked for help with for, for at least two or three appointments. Get your client making good progress. And as your client is making good progress, you can begin to branch out. They'll either have new symptoms that they are now aware of that you can help with, or you can look at their eyes and say, hey, do you want to do some preventive work? Do you want to get in there and, and cut some things short that might want to become problems in the near future? 
most people will say yes. And then you can dive in and start prioritizing what you're seeing, the significance of the impact, and get them working on reversing symptoms and reversing the underlying chemistries, right? So here we go. Let's start looking at some eyeballs. We've got three different eyes. We've got a lymphatic eye, a biliary eye, and a hematogenic eye here. Those are your three base constitutions in constitutional iridology. But what you see here is that the iris is made up of layers of fiber. And sometimes, like in an eye like this, where we have all of these, what we call lacunae, we can see that the top layer has separations and we're looking at the bottom, we're looking at a layer that's down lower in that gap. In this iris, again, you can see that we've got a separation on the top layer. And so we are looking at fiber structure that is down a layer because the iris is made up of layers of these, this trabecular mesh. Sometimes you will have an eye that either has so much pigment or has such dense fiber structure that there are no gaps that you don't see easily down below. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. We also know that this, this is in the cornea. If you studied Jensen, you would call this a sodium ring or a cholesterol ring. In iridology, we call it a light, or in constitutional, we call it a lipemic diathesis, right? And that gives us a ton of information when we combine that with this little mark here, with the yellow color here, and with this brown pigment, those things combine to give us a really tight story that says we need to pay attention to the liver here. I'm gonna ask a lot of liver questions. I'm going to see, do the client's symptoms correlate to liver imbalance. This is why knowing your anatomy and physiology is so important. I mean, the liver does 500 different jobs. You should be able to list at least five of them and you're not allowed to say it detoxifies. I would want more detail on that one, right? I'd wanna know a little bit more about detoxifies. It certainly doesn't filter. It's not a filter. If you say filter, you get a great big red X, right? But if you said it has immune functions, it creates, it takes carbs and creates cholesterol. It breaks down hormones after they've done their job. It has phase one and phase two detox. Phase one breaks things down in the bloodstream that are no longer needed. And it breaks them down into less harmful substances that are a little more neutral. Phase two picks them up and breaks them down into water solubles that can be put back into the, into the bloodstream for the kidneys to remove. Like you should know that. Um, you should know that uh, like migraine headaches often come from the liver, for instance, there's, there's just so many things the liver does liver stores iron, right? Liver works with pancreas to balance blood sugars. And when you have that kind of understanding of anatomy and physiology, which is why I insist that my students have A and P before they come into me, um, it means we go deeper. We connect dots. Other teachers would tell you this means liver. This means cholesterol. This means liver this is jaundice, it means liver, but they wouldn't teach you how to connect it. How do those join up? And how do they teach you? What questions do they teach you to ask? Okay. So really important that you've got the A and P because the better you've got your A and P, the deeper we go with iridology. Now I started learning iridology in 1979. Constitutional iridology had not yet made it to Canada. It was going to be a while yet. So as I said earlier, I studied under a first generation Jensenian. She had been to Escondido a couple of times to study with Dr. Jensen. And um, I learned, I glommed on to everything she said. I took everything as gospel true. I was very sure that it was absolutely perfect until I wasn't. Until after about five years, I started to go, this isn't working. It's not working the way you said it would. And then after 10 years, I was ready to walk away. And that's when I was blessed to start learning constitutional. As a Jensenian, I would see an eye like this that I'd been taught to call these lesions. I'd been taught that every one of these was a pathological problem that was happening right now. I was also taught that if we did the correct diet and the correct supplements, we could actually make these go away. I was taught that these fibers that are inside the lacuna were healing lines and that um, 
that those were the result of the, the good things we were doing. And so there was a lot of, of information that I was taught that it was wrong. I would say to my clients, well, you've got a problem with this organ or this organ or this organ or this organ. And I was usually wrong. We would do cleanses and fasts and we would build and we would work hard thinking that this was going to go away and it never did. And so I was, like I said, ready to walk away from this until I learned constitutional. And what we know with constitutional is these are inherited. The I, the I rides give us information going back three to four generations. So this gives us information about what's been passed down. So when we see these, these are suggestions of predispositions, but they are predispositions only. And what that means is if this person figured out at a young age that, for example, um, eating cookies and soda pop didn't make them feel well, which it wouldn't, that would really mess with this person. They figured that out and they decided I'm never going to eat cookies and soda pop again. And they said, I'm going to eat vegetables and fruit instead. And I feel really good when I eat some protein three times a day. They're already doing the foundational work, some of the foundational work that they need to do to prevent problems that these things could be suggesting. So when our clients come in with that foundation, we aren't starting at ground zero. We're able to look at their eyes and say, well, this is the genetics. This is what I would have expected you to have for symptoms if you were living a riotous lifestyle. You're doing these good things. Therefore, you don't have those symptoms. Therefore, we're going to build on the foundation you brought in. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, give me, a, give me a makes sense in the comments box. Seriously, as a Jensenian, I was very sure that I should be handing out my, my, we knew some people who were undertakers that I should be handing out their business cards because it, it was hopeless. Everything in the eye was a problem. So with this particular client, again, doing things to balance her hormones and her blood sugars, that's 95% of what she needs to, to work on. And those are not flash in the pan programs, they are lifestyles, right? Teaching the client what foods to eat, what supplements to use, when to take different kinds of supplements will go a long way to helping her be healthy and happy and will improve her symptoms but we're never going to see these disappear in her eyes. They're always going to be there. And I've made a point of telling my clients, these are beautiful eyes. Eyes are works of art. They give us information. They teach us about you and they are beautiful. No one's got eyes like yours, right? So this, this is a good case study. This is a client came to me in her mid thirties and she and her husband had been trying to have a baby for a couple of years with no success. She, and so she really just wanted to get pregnant. That's all she wanted. And her husband's semen analysis was fine. So as we started looking at her eyes and asking questions, she was having a period every 28 days, but she described the flow as being a smear on the toilet paper. She never had to use any sanitary products of any kind. Now the doctor said she was just fine, that there was no problem that she should just go home and keep having sex with her husband because she would get pregnant. But the fact that she didn't actually have a menstrual flow was a, a flag to me because it suggested that the endometrial lining wasn't very thick, which means the hormones were out of balance, even though the doctor said they were balanced, they weren't. And she also had no ovulatory mucus. So she wasn't um, ovulating well either. She didn't have the progesterone to carry a conceived, uh, uh, a fertilized egg all the way up to having a baby with it. So there were some problems. Just a little pigment here, a teeny tiny one right here. That's enough, was enough for me on our first appointment for me to think, huh, I wonder if she has MTHFR defect. Hopefully you know what that is. And, um, and I didn't say that to her. She was a very nervous Nelly very nervous. So I had to pick and choose my words carefully so as not to get her just wind her into an anxious state. So I, um, I, I wondered if she had that problem. I noticed that she's got, again, lots of lacunae, 
right close in here, which usually again suggests that risk of blood sugar and endocrine imbalance. Her diet was really clean, mostly organic, pretty much all from scratch, not enough fat, not enough protein. All right, really important when you're trying to get pregnant. Now I want you to compare these eyes to the next slide. Same person, different lighting. Okay, get a really good look at these eyes because I want you to do this comparison. What do you see that is different besides the lighting? What is more obvious? Let me go back again. Do you see anything that is a little more obvious in some areas on this set of eyes? I want you to look right here and right here. Do you see we've got a lot more lines visible going around? I call them wrinkles. Now, this alone tells us she's sympathetic dominant, right? That tells us she burns through her B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, and magnesium very quickly. It tells us her adrenals are going to be tired. She's always going to be on edge waiting for the next bomb to go off. And the bomb could be as little as she broke a fingernail. And her whole nervous system is going to respond to that. So I asked her about stress and she internalized her stress. She was working in human relations in an oil patch company. She was the one who had to deal with employees who had problems, including mental health problems. Yeah, she, she came in for an appointment one day and she was just shaking. She'd been so rattled. And I said, hey, sit down, just catch your breath. What's going on? And she said, we had to fire somebody today and he came to my office and he threatened to commit suicide in my office. We had to call security and we had to call, you know, ambulance and we had to take him to the hospital for a psyche eval. It's like, holy doodle, that's not the right job for this lady, I'll tell you. So with all of this, with what I saw in her eyes, with what I knew about how she was put together, I was able to give her the right kinds of vitamins to deal with the MTHFR, the suspected MTHFR. I knew her liver needed some support, so I was able to use N-acetylcysteine with her. And I wanted to use some omega-3 with her to give her more building blocks to make her hormones. We, very, we had her checking her basal temperature every day and charting that and posting it on an app where I could see it so that I could monitor what her hormones were doing based on her basal temperature. We added some, some specific herbs for the follicular phase and we changed those out for the luteal phase every month. So she had a, a two phase program. Within a few months, she called me and she said like, and I was, we were seeing each other every month, but she called me between appointments and she said, huh, I, um, I actually needed a sanitary pad for my period. It started today. I'm going, yes, that is such good news, right? Took her a little while, it took her about six months, but she got pregnant and she was so nervous through the whole thing. Every little hiccup, every little fart, I'll tell you, every burp was a panic call, which I kind of anticipated with all of these contraction throws in her eyes. Well, about four months into her pregnancy, she decided to do 23 and Me. And when she got the results, she sent me an email and I swear my computer nearly exploded. It was just uh, vibrating with anxiety. And she said, I got my results back. Oh my goodness. It says I have this MTHFR defect. Have I hurt my baby? Is my baby going to be okay? And I was able to say to her, I suspected that. I've had your back since our very first appointment. We've been, I've been working with you as if you had MTHFR. And so you've got nothing to worry about. We've totally taken care of it. Now, what I want you to take away from this is I did not focus on every single mark. That is what most teachers are going to teach you, that you have to document every single indicator, whether it's a lacuna, whether it's a color, whether it's a little pigment, whether it's a contraction furrow, maybe it's a tiny separation in the fibers or a bigger separation in the fibers. Most teachers will teach you to document absolutely everything. For this client, most of that was irrelevant. There was no sense in wasting time, spending energy, diving into that kind of detail when it was these details were about something that hadn't shown up yet and were not important to the client yet. 
she wanted to get pregnant. So when I assessed her eyes, I didn't nitpick details. I took that knowledge of anatomy and physiology, what I know about hormones, what I saw in her eyes that taught me about her, her predispositions towards hormone imbalances, combined that to create a tight little program that helped her to work towards getting pregnant. And we tweaked the program every month when we met. We would fine tune, might take something out, put something else in, increase something, decrease something. So we tweaked it, but we knew what we were doing and I knew what the pathway was. Now, for those of you that have a bit of iridology under your belt, is this sounding a little bit different from what you've already learned or how you were taught? If it is, just give me a, a taught, T-A-U-G-H-T, taught in the chat box. I just, I'm just curious to see if this is pretty different from what you've got already. So while you're typing that in, you know, when I first learned iridology, I was taught that an eye like this meant this person was full of toxins that they needed to cleanse. And that if we did the cleansing, if we did the right things, this eye would turn blue. They had, the teachers often had before and after pictures that looked very convincing. But what I found very interesting is I, as I've learned more about iris photography, and as I look at those before and after pictures, I realized two things. Number one, they either weren't the same person, or number two, they used different cameras or different settings on the camera or different lighting to get their before and after pictures, All right? And so this is su such an important thing to realize. I've had people who follow certain instructors and I'm gonna let them remain nameless, have sent me pictures and said, you can't tell me this isn't proof that this program works, that you know this cleanse that we sell works. And I said, yes, I can. I can tell you it's not proof. They were taken with different cameras and different lighting. That means your before and after data is dirty data. It's invalid. Well, you're just, you just don't know what you're talking about. No, actually I do, I do. I know cameras as far as iridology goes. And I know, and you can tell by looking that these were taken by different cameras, which means the, the, the data is dirty. I can do before and after photos. I know how to manipulate my settings on my camera. I can even just change I've got two different illuminators for my camera. If I change them out, it looks like before and after photos. I can do that. I can lie to people, but I won't. I won't. And so, and they've called me some really pretty nasty names, but it's okay. Because I know that I know that I'm right. And I know that I've got the proof that they are wrong. And so I'm com very confident in what I am talking about. So this eye is never going to turn blue. You could cleanse this person till there was nothing left of them. It's not going to turn blue. These colors in the eye are genetic. Sometimes you will see pigments like this develop over time. I want you to consider that in the light of two things. Well, three things actually. Number one, my hair has not always been gray. Why did it change color? Because that's how my genes are programmed, right? how my genes are programmed. This has genetic programming behind it. So when we see more pigments come up, that's genetic programming. Um, I had two other things that I was gonna share with you and they have totally derailed. Huh, that's how it goes sometimes. Um, and so what we wanna just be aware of is that there's a lot of genetic programming in the color of the eyes, right? And some people say, yeah, but what about epigenetics? Can't we turn those genes off? We can, do you know how much work that takes? Do you know how few people are willing to do that kind of work? We're never gonna see this disappear from the eye. The iris is very stingy. It's not going to let it go, okay? It's gonna stay there. So in constitutional iridology, this eye is telling us this person is predisposed to some liver and some kidney. Now, what liver, what kidney, we don't know. That's where the conversation comes in. That's where we sometimes, I sometimes will send my clients back to their doctors to get some lab tests done, right? 
And so um, we've got liver and we've got kidney. We've got sympathetic nervous system. We've got sympathetic dominant here. So this person internalizes their stress. What does that mean for nutrients? What nutrients do we burn through more quickly when we're under stress? I want to know if you know that. If you know what nutrients you burn through more quickly when you're under stress, list those nutrients in the chat box for me. Okay, tell me which nutrients do you need more of when you're under stress? I'm going to wait till somebody answers. Just so as you know, I've got seven children. I'm very patient. What are the nutrients we burn through more quickly when we are under stress? If you don't know for sure, just take a guess. Yeah, Melinda. Yeah, calcium and magnesium. That's two of them. Good job. Two more. Two more. Melinda, that's brilliant. Fantastic. One thing I won't need to teach you when I get you into the course. What are two other nutrients? One is crucial and the other is a helper for, for the, for it. So two other nutrients. Often when you're at the health food store, the vitamin store, it'll actually have a particular word right on the label. It'll usually say stress. What are the two key nutrients in a stress formulation? Who's going to be brave? B12 is a very small part of it. Can you broaden that out, Melinda? Instead of just B12, it's all of the... Which complex? Which complex? Who's got this one? Okay, well, we're going to let that question hang unanswered until someone answers it, but I'm going to keep going on. So we know we need to do some things to support what's going on with these contraction furrows with that sympathetic dominance, right? And we're going to need to then ask questions about what is their diet? What are they eating? What are they drinking? What is the lifestyle? What about sleep? What do they do for physical activity? Um, have they ever had been diagnosed with actually one of the first questions I ask every client is besides what do you want me to help with? Is there a personal or family history of anything? That's a really good second question to ask because then if they talk about heart attack or stroke or mental health issues or whatever, it's already on the table. So if we see an eye like this, we can say, Hmm, this client might be slightly at risk for something mental health oriented depression or anxiety, right? And so we get the answers to these questions because those are the questions that eyes want us to ask. And the answers, the, the answers our client gives us will give us the information we need to create a program. Now we can identify markings, individual markings, but it's not a case of one mark equals one problem. Rodney, thanks for weighing in on that. Zinc or iron, maybe not quite. Those certainly have a lot of other functions that are not so much about, about what we're looking for here as far as nutrients that you burn through quickly when you have stress. But good effort, good effort. Thanks for weighing in on that. When we understand our anatomy and physiology and how the organs interact with each other, and when we understand the current symptoms and the health history, it helps us to pick and choose from the iris what we need to focus on. And that helps us to choose the right things to do or the best things to do. So you probably already know that liver requires B vitamins. Hint, hint. B vitamins are crucial to help us manage stress. Yeah, folic acid is one of those, Tori. Good job. Yeah, folic acid is one of them. That's a part of the B complex, right? And then we need vitamin C to help with the Bs. You assimilate your, your B vitamins better in the presence of vitamin C. And so we know from this person's eye with that liver and kidney predisposition, the liver needs B vitamins. We know that this person is sympathetic dominant. So the nervous system needs B vitamins. One of the first things we're going to do is make sure we've given them 
a really well formulated B complex. And then we're going to balance out their foods. What are some foods that drain B vitamins out of your body? Anyone have a guess? What are some foods that deplete your B vitamins that actually require B vitamins for you to get that junk out of your system? Any guesses or any, do you know, do you have some nutrition training behind you and you know? And if you don't, that's okay. We do include a bit of herbology and nutrition in the dynamic iridology course. So if you don't have any, you at least have a foundation to launch from. Any ideas? Processed food, oh, Melinda, yes, processed food. Anything that's processed. I'm gonna add to that coffee. Coffee is really bad for your B vitamins, right? Really bad. So we would work with the diet. We would maybe not take away all the processed food if that's all she's eating. We maybe can't start with everything, but maybe we start with reducing the coffee and getting her to give up the donuts every day. Maybe we get her to then begin including something like some hemp hearts or um, some eggs with the yolk to begin picking up better nutrition, including some B vitamins. Right, so we can start building the program very quickly. We never want to give the client all of the information in one sitting because it's too much. They can't do it all. And if they can't do it all and do it well between now and the next appointment, they won't come back. So you choose a couple of recommendations that you know will have the biggest impact and that you're very sure your client can follow through with. And you ask them to buy into it. Is this something you could actually do? Could you actually cut your coffee consumption from eight cups a day to four cups a day? Because that will make a huge difference. Could you actually add some protein, maybe a couple of eggs to breakfast every day? I don't care how you prepare them just yet. Just could you do that? And if they say yes, great. That's all the changes we're doing and we're adding a B vitamin. That's it, because they can do that. They can be successful. They'll feel that little bit of improvement. And then, and then they're going to wanna come back and say, yes, I did it. And I'm feeling like you said I would, what comes next? So Tori's Riching, uh, is, uh, Tori Richardson is asking, vegan diet can contribute. I'm not understanding can contribute to what Tori, can you? Expand that question for me. While you're doing that, we'll look at another one. Uh, this is a client who is about 40 years of age. Um, vegan diet can contribute to particularly a folic acid and a B12 deficiency. It can. You have to be a really clever vegan to get those and deal with it well. You're absolutely right. So that's where we, we need to use supplementation, particularly with our vegans. So this client, uh, this client actually, she's not over 40. She was in her mid 60s. She's been a client of mine for four decades. She was one of my original clients when we started and she is still a client now, which is really cool. I mean, how many people can say they've got a good handful of clients that have been with them for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, right? I've got quite a few that keep, you know, they come in for several appointments and they disappear for a few years, things start to fall apart. So they come back for a few appointments, we get them back on track and then they go away for a few years. And while they're away, they're telling people about me, right? So that's very cool. Well, she started to come back a couple of years ago because she had gained some weight and she wanted to lose it. Her blood pressure was elevated and the doctor wanted to medicate her for that. Her cholesterol was up and so were her triglycerides and her hemoglobin A1C. So the doctor was talking about all kinds of medications. And this woman actually knows a lot about herbs and a lot about nutrition. And she knew she didn't want to do the drugs. It's really important for us to remember that these eyes do not show toxicity. They show predisposition towards liver imbalance, predisposition towards kidneys wanting to be in balance. They show that the liver has been out of balance for some time and is not managing the carbohydrates properly. And that's what's leading to the triglycerides, the hemoglobin A1C and the cholesterol, right? And so she's got these indicators in her eyes. And um, 
And we're not going to get rid of this. We're not going to get rid of this. We're not going to turn these eyes blue. We're not even going to just lighten them out to all gold. They're not going to change. And I don't care that they don't change. What I care about is, do we get results? Can we change her blood numbers? Can we get her losing weight? So what we did, because she's been with me for all these years and she knows her stuff, she was just going through a really stressful time at home and she just needed someone to walk with her and to say, this is what you need to do. And I know you know this. Let's dig deep. Let's find it. Let's just start doing what you know to do. And she'd go, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. She just needed someone to take charge and love her through this. So we, um, she's also sympathetic dominant. So she internalizes her stress, right? So we knew we needed to support her liver. We've got some digestive markers here. We needed to support digestion. We needed to support her, her nervous system. So lots of things to support, but we can do that easily with a lot of food choices, especially with someone who knows their stuff like she does. So again, it was, we needed to get her eating leafy greens, good serving of leafy greens every day. We needed her to be doing protein three times a day. And we talked about serving sizes and choices of proteins needed to get her walking for 30 minutes a day. I needed to get her to cut out the refined carbs. Her husband was doing most of the cooking and he does not cook healthy foods. So it was really to the point where I said, you're going to have to tell Jim he can cook for himself and you'll cook for yourself because he's not going to change. You know, he's not going to change. He's already told you he's not going to cook for you the way you need it. You're going to have to do it on your own. She went, yeah, darn. I said, yeah, but it's going to be good for you. So we got her doing those things. We used some omega-3. We used some berberin IR to help with the blood sugars. We worked on her gut biome. We used a protein digestive aid. Now she's well-versed at taking supplements. So I could do a much broader, a bigger, heavier program with her. We used some general digestive enzymes. And again, the protein at breakfast and the leafy greens. She lost 20 pounds in three months. And all of her lab numbers after three months of working with me were in the normal range. Her doctor was stunned and amazed. Client was very happy. Hadn't quite got everywhere she wanted to go. She wanted to take off another 10 pounds. They had a family crisis. It threw her off balance. She stopped taking care of herself again. And then about a year after that, she had a heart attack that emotionally totally linked back to the family crisis, totally linked back. And so we've been working together again and she works with a psychologist as well. And so she's working through all the emotional stuff and we are working on everything else. But because of the heart attack, um, the one, one of the things her, her husband did well, they live just a couple of miles from a hospital and he's worked in, in industrial health and safety. He recognized it was a heart attack. He knew if he called for the ambulance, it would take 30 minutes to get there, even though they were so close to the hospital. He just basically threw her in the car and took her to the hospital because they got there in like three minutes flat without speeding and without running any red lights. And of course, with a heart attack, a suspected heart attack, she was whisked straight in. She's doing very well, very, very well. I'm very pleased to say, but the doctors have put the fear into her that if she does anything they don't say, it will have detrimental effects. So right now she's on, I think, nine medications. And our goal is to, again, work with her emotions and her diet and her lifestyle, get her back on track and see if we can get her to where the doctors will go, will tell her she's doing well and to where they will agree that she could start weaning off at least some of the meds, right? Another set of eyes. Again, my original training said that Every lacuna is an issue. I like what Tori says. The fear mongering is real. So sad. And it is. And it's been super real for the last four years, hasn't it? And it's not going to end. We just need to know what we know and work with what we can, right? I was originally taught that every one of these closed petal shapes was um, a problem that was happening right now. We could heal them away. We could cleanse them out. We could cleanse out the pigments. We could get rid of the yellow. We could get rid of the brown. But then I learned about constitutional iridology and I decided to give it a chance. I should have the videos right here because I still own them. Back then we were using VHS videotapes. Okay, I don't know if any of you are as old as I am to know what a VHS videotape is. 
but I ordered the videotapes that Bill Caradonna and Harry Wolf had created. Amy does, yay, Amy, and so does Sherry. Yep, fantastic. I've got some age mates here. That's brilliant. I don't feel like the, the oldest person in the classroom, maybe. And so um, I watched those videos. I don't know how many times, you know, few minutes, pause it, write notes, few minutes, pause it, write notes, watch it again, add to my notes, watch it again, add to my notes. And that was how I started to learn constitutional until I was able to bring Bill Cardona up to teach a certification course. Best thing I ever did. Best thing I ever did. What we know, and again, I've mentioned this previously, is each of these shows us an inherent possibility, not a guarantee. So this tells us what this person's genetic structure is like. This tells us that an organ wants to be out of balance and it may want to cause problems for another organ. So what do you do with that? You deal with the troublemaker, right? You deal with the one that wants to be out of balance so it can't have a negative impact on anything else. This is not an accumulation of toxins. Not at all. Not at all. So constitutional iridology teaches us to look for patterns. It teaches us to link markings together to create the understanding of what's going on, what this body is capable of when we understand that and we understand the client's symptoms, we then understand what the root causes are. And that helps us to understand what we need to do with our client. So this person with this type of an eye might have issues with their connective tissues, might have kidney issues where the kidneys don't want to keep up, has some predisposition towards liver issues, lymphatic issues, and immune system issues. Hopefully they don't have all of those all at once, but they're all connected to some degree or another. And so as we understand their diet, we can work with that, right? We can help them use their foods to improve their health. We can, if we know supplements, if that is in your scope of practice, you can recommend supplements or herbs or something else, aromatherapy, right? Our goal is not to change the eyes. Our goal is to improve their health. And iridology allows us to see where those potential changes challenges are and helps us to teach our clients about what they can do to improve their health, specifically their health, not a cookie cutter program, but their health. No two clients of mine ever leave the office with the same program. I might have two women, both with PCOS, both who want to have babies, their temperature charts look identical. I can guarantee they're not walking out of here with the exact same program. There will be similarities, but they will be individual programs based on the eyes, based on my conversation with the client. So with all of this, again, we need to, this helps us to tailor make the programs very quickly and to tailor make them step by step. A few changes now a few more next month when we see they're doing well, as they keep doing well, we keep tweaking the program, refining the program until we really got them in a good place, knowing that there is no program that will ever be perfect for an entire lifetime because the body will change. Even with the best of care, the body will shift and that program will always at some point in time need to be tweaked. Does that make sense? Does that make sense that there's no program that is perfect for a lifetime? Iridology helps us to understand that. If that, if that does make sense, that no program is perfect for a lifetime, Rodney says, yes. Thank you, Rodney. I appreciate that. Jensenian iridology would say this is a person who's headed for a nervous breakdown and this person has parasites. Absolutely guaranteed this person has parasites. That's not what constitutional teaches. Constitutional says that all of this combines to tell us that this person internalizes their stress dramatically. This was an Asian client in her mid thirties. She and her husband were struggling with fertility, heavy checked out fine. She had been to the, the fertility clinic. They had checked her out and they'd said, yep, you have problems. And so as we're working together, all she said when she came in, she and her husband came in was, we want to have a baby. She didn't give me any background. So I'm looking at her eyes and I'm thinking, okay, we've got, 
one of these sitting right in an ovary in both eyes. We've got liver not wanting to handle carbohydrates properly. Petite little Asian woman. And so I said, uh, how are your blood sugars? What's going on there? And she said, oh yeah, I'm type two diabetic. That would have been nice to lead with. Okay. And then as I see the thing in the radial furrow in the ovary, I'm going, has anyone ever maybe suggested, and I'm not saying you have this, but has anyone ever suggested you might have polycystic ovarian syndrome? And she said, oh yeah, they said that too. And I'm going, that would have been good to lead with too, but I'm glad I was able to sort that out from your symptoms and from what we're seeing here. Again, we worked really, really hard with her and um, we worked for 18 months. We got her from menstrual cycles that were 90 days apart down to cycles that were 32 to 35 days apart. 90 days is an infertile cycle, period. I don't care what anyone says. You'll never conceive on a 90 day cycle and carry the pregnancy. So we got her down to like a 32 to 35 day cycle. And there she sat for about a year. And we were getting ready for an appointment. She and her husband came in every month. We tweaked, we refined, we, we worked. And I had spent the night awake and struggling. I was trying to figure out how I was going to tell them that I couldn't do anything more for them. I was trying to figure out how I could say, you know, there's really, there's nothing more I can offer you. I've done everything, including I did extra research to learn more and to dig deeper. And they came in and they said, as they sat down and I was getting ready to go, to say, you know, we need to have a conversation. They said, we did a pregnancy test this morning and we're pregnant, right? Healthy pregnancy. The doctors had told her she would go into full-blown gestational diabetes. She did not. She followed my instructions to the letter. Her husband did all the cooking because he knew it would stress her out to have to do the cooking. He did all the cooking. I wish I could live with them because he did such a great job. She had a, they had a beautiful baby boy at term no gestational diabetes. And she had a four hour labor and delivery from start to finish, almost a little too quick, but you know, it, it worked. It finally worked. And so I wouldn't have known to do all of the different little tweaks and refinements that I did to her program as we were working. If I hadn't had her eyes to work with, I'd have just been doing the same old things that everybody does. You know, let's try some Maca. Let's try some, oh, I don't know, you've got PCOS. Let's try, try some myo inositol. Um, let's try, um, oh, I don't know, you know, and we would just have been doing what everybody does. But because we had the eyes, I could, I would look at them and I would, after that first visit, you, know, you read them quickly, then I'd look at them again later on, like in the next appointment, I go, oh, I missed that the first go round. All right, that means I want to go this direction, literally that changed our direction, right? And so just so brilliant, so brilliant. Fellow again, a returning client, he'd been to me about six years ago, we started working and then he kind of fell away and that's okay because now he was coming back. He's in his, he's 64, he's five feet 11, weighs 175 pounds. He'd been to the doctor, his hemoglobin A was, A1C was 7.2, which suggests going pre-diabetic and should be under 5.9. His glomerular filtration rate was 61. 60 is the cutoff point. Anything above that, you're starting to edge into kidney disease. His potassium was slightly low. They put him on a diuretic for that glomerular filtration. I can't say that for some reason. And, and the diuretic probably tanked his um, potassium. So again, the doctor had put him on metformin to try to get that hemoglobin A1C down. That gave this gentleman diarrhea. They switched him to Glumetza and Giardiance and they seemed to be okay, but this fellow really didn't want to be on these drugs. He really didn't want to do it. They'd also put him on hydrochlorothiazide for the blood pressure, Trandolapril for the cholesterol. He was also on um, Viagra because the blood pressure medications made it so he couldn't perform in bed. He was on myelin torvastatin, which is a statin drug for the cholesterol. I mean, he was on so many drugs. And I noted when he was in my office that he did a lot of... <clears throat> <clears throat> my experience has been that that is one of two things. That is either mucus in the throat from acid reflux 
where there's usually there's no burning up the esophagus. There's just enough acid reflux to make the throat secrete extra mucus. Or I've seen it all too many times as one of the first warnings of congestive heart failure. You know, I can't diagnose that. I can't diagnose reflux, but I, I noted that in his file that he was constantly clearing his throat. And of course he wasn't even aware of it. His diet when we started cinnamon buns for breakfast or a muffin or Cheerios. Lunch was a sandwich on white bread, usually some kind of processed meat, tuna salad or egg salad, supper, typically fast food. His wife is a flight attendant, so she goes on, on four-day pairings, so she's gone for four days at a time, so he's on his own. So he'll order in pasta, or he'll go to a restaurant and pick up you know, some meat and some veggies, or um, he'll order a pizza, or he'll order Chinese, but he doesn't cook from scratch. So uh, the one good thing he did was he was drinking about three liters of water a day. The diuretic was probably making him very thirsty. He's got a slight lipemic diathesis. So we know the liver's not happy and the liver is messing with his carbohydrates, which is what's leading to the triglycerides and the cholesterol. He's got a stomach ring. So we know that he is probably very prone to not handling his proteins well with particularly with what I see in that stomach ring. So, and we know that he's prone to having a very sluggish bowel and we've got those contraction furries. So he internalizes the stress. So in that first appointment, because he'd been a client of mine before, I tended to push a little harder. Like you forgot what we did the first time. Here's the reminder and we're building on it, right? So we did protein and veggies. I suggested protein and veggies for breakfast. And I, I teased my clients. Your mantra is now protein and veggies, protein and veggies. They all laugh at that, but they never forget it. And so um, we got him doing eggs and veggies for breakfast, a stir fry of veggies, which was great. You pre-chop those, leave them in the fridge enough for three or four days and just cook them up fresh in the morning. Got him to snack on an apple with clean nut butter, not the commercial stuff that's full of all the garbage. Uh, we got him to focus on a large salad at lunchtime with a good about four ounce portion of meat. He's a big man, so the meat is important for him. And for supper, we got him again to do protein and veggies. And we got him to be thinking of portion control, particularly on, on any carbohydrate type vegetables, to go really minimal on the carbs and to go maximum on the low carb veg. Also worked with him to chew his food. What we did for supplements, we did L-arginine because that's a vasodilator. It helps to create the NO2, vasodilates, and that helped to bring his blood, start bringing his blood pressure down on the spot. It's not a permanent solution, but it bought us some time. We got him to do the Berberin IR, which is brilliant for reducing insulin resistance. And we got him to walk twice a day for 30 minutes each time. Okay. So we've done a little bit of diet work and got him being more physically active. Next appointment, we added a protein digestive aid and we added a general enzyme to handle the carbs and the fats. And in that second appointment, he was still on the blood pressure medications, but even with the blood pressure medications in the first appointment, his blood pressure was elevated. It was over 130. In the second appointment, it was down to 118 over 74. And he, he responded really fast. He had gone for labs pretty quickly. Uh, uh, sorry, we'd seen him. He'd gone for labs about three or four weeks later and brought those labs in. And his blood sugars were already down closer to six. Just from a few dietary changes, a few supplements and getting him to be active every day his hemoglobin was down to 5.9. Pretty exciting stuff. It's, he's been working with his doctor and his doctor has been watching his numbers and has, has kept saying, you keep doing this. I'm going to have to take you off some of those medications. Right? So after a year on the blood sugar meds, the doctor took him off the uh, Giardi and send the Glumatza and the triglycerides are coming down. The blood pressure is coming down to where they're having to adjust his blood pressure meds and they are reducing his cholesterol meds as well because he's doing the work. And it's work that I wouldn't have known to do necessarily if I hadn't seen his tendencies.
All right. So what are you thinking here? Do you see how this is so quick when you know it, it's so quick and easy. Do you see, could you understand how I was connecting dots? If you could see how those dots connected, give me dots in the, in the comments box. I raced through it pretty quick, but I want to make sure this is landing for you. Dots, yeah. Melinda's saying dots, yeah. Yeah, yeah, lots of you. Fantastic, fantastic. So with that, that was quite, that was a lot of iridology in that. I would like to introduce you to the dynamic iridology assessment system. And again, I'm not going to give you a link to register for the class. There's, I'm not putting that kind of pressure on you. I hate it when, and that's a strong word, I know, when I'm attending a webinar that they say is going to be educational and they really just, it's a hard sell. That's not my style. Um, so I'm going to introduce this and then I'm going to give you some more information about the course. So the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System is the only live, online, fully mentored course for health professionals. If you've got anatomy and physiology under your belt, you're licensed, maybe you're a licensed massage therapist or an RN or an LPN and you had to do a &P with that. Maybe you're a naturopath or a chiropractor or a physiotherapist. Maybe you had to do um, a and P as a separate course inside a nutrition program or inside a herbal program. That's what we want is a separate a and P course in what you've done that qualifies you as a health professional or a prospective health professional. The purpose of learning iridology, the way I teach it is to help you not work unpaid overtime. When you only learn nuts and bolts, it means that you see the client, you maybe get photos of their eyes, you go away and you spend two or three or four hours combing over those photos to write a detailed report to bring back to your client at a later time. Problem is, I know for sure if you're doing it that way, you're not charging enough to cover those extra hours of homework you did. I know it. I've never met anyone who does iridology that way who is charging enough to cover those extra hours. So I want you to not work unpaid overtime. I want to teach you iridology like what I've showed you where you can do the assessment right now, do the program creation right now, integrate it very cleanly with what your clients need. The other benefit here is if it takes you two to four hours to write a report, you're overwhelming your clients with that report. You're giving them way too much information. You're doing a case study. You're not creating a protocol. Fast difference between those two things. And so we want to stop overwhelming our clients with too much information and programs that are meant to last them a lifetime. The program is meant to last them a month, maybe two, right? And you do that, you see them every month or two until they're in a good place. And then you let them fade off. You say, hey, you're in a great place. I'm here when you need me. I'll reach out to you in six months and see how you're doing. You know, call me if you ever need them if, or when you need an appointment, because I'll be here. Kind of play it both ways. I'll reach out, you reach out. We'll make sure you have, have what you need as you need it, right? Uh, we want to create programs that will increase client compliance. The more successful your clients are in sticking to your program, the more compliant they will be, the longer they will be your client, and the more they will chat you up. I had a phone call or an email from someone the other day who wanted to book an appointment and um, fertility. I love doing fertility work. I'm so glad she reached out and she said, you know, my aunt said I should give you a call because apparently you've helped two of my cousins have babies in the last few years. It's like, yes, yes. I love that when people do my advertising. Our next dynamic iridology course is starting on January 25th. The class time is five o'clock till about 7.15 mountain time. The only way you get to enroll in this program is if I speak with you one-on-one. -on -one. I wanna make sure you know, I wanna make sure actually that this is a good fit for you. I wanna make sure you've got your a and I wanna make sure you've got, that, that it's just a good fit. I don't want students where the course is gonna create undue stress or where it's not a good fit. Some, and probably 70%, 65 to 70% of the people I speak with are not ready. 
but I'm happy to speak with all of them because I, I want, I want to get to know them. There's some really neat people out there and you're probably among those neat people. I want to get to know you a little bit. And then if in our conversation, it's, it's a good fit, I will give you the enrollment link and invite you to enroll. I've pasted the URL in the chat box for you to book a time to speak with me privately. No cost, no obligation. This is not a thumb screws exercise. This is a chance for us to have a conversation to see if this program fits, All right? The course is made up of 20, 20 individual classes. We meet once a week for 20 weeks. And this is the classwork. This isn't to certify you. This is to give you the training to prepare you for the certification process. Um, every class is recorded for playback on demand and maximum of 10 students per cohort. I keep the group small so we have enough time to make sure that all of your questions are answered and you have all the support you need. I don't pass you off to an assistant. It's all me. We have live group mentoring twice each month via webinars. So students and graduates are invited to join me twice each month. If you're working on a case and you need some support with that, you need some input. Maybe you've got a question about business. Maybe you've got a question about iridology equipment. Maybe you've got a question about anything related to iridology. You can bring that into office hours and I will support you. You will not be kicked out of office hours when your course is finished. You will not be kicked out after you've certified with IPA. You are welcome to attend office hours until I decide I'm not teaching anymore. Right? And that's not going to be real soon. I have too much fun teaching. We have a private student and alumni group in the MeWe platform. Facebook likes to censor us. MeWe doesn't censor us at all. So we are on MeWe and it's private. Again, it's for my students and my alumni. You get to hang out with us there. Again, post questions, comment on other people's posts, be a part of our community. Again, for as long as I have the program running. As a gift, I, I gift you the textbook in a digital form. It is not available in a print form. I wrote the book. It's been approved by IPA as a textbook. I've had other IPA instructors ask. They were on the board of directors for IPA and they were on the education committee. They asked if they could buy a copy. Uh, -uh. It's not for sale. It is a gift for my students and I keep it current and up to date. So when IPA tweaks the curriculum, or when there's new research to support something, I insert that into the book and all of my students past and present have access to the newest version. If you've priced iridology textbooks, they run about 250 bucks a piece. I also give you a gift of the cheat sheets. This is literally, it's the Cliff's Notes or Cole's Notes for iridology. Everything you're gonna learn condensed down into 45 pages of charts and tables. And I also include for, for a limited time, for 10 months from your last class, I will mentor you as required. And there's specific steps in this mentoring that have to happen according to IPA. I will mentor you in that way to prepare you for certification. Most iridology instructors charge extra for the exam mentoring, for the certification mentoring. I include it as my gift. Again, it's a 10 month limit from your last class, very doable. Many of my students complete their certification within four months of finishing the classwork. Sophia Perez, uh, Sophia Perez Villar um, posted this on the IPA site um, on, under my tag. The commitment that Judith has for teaching is extraordinary and the amount of support you get from this iridology course is fabulous. The material is very clear and thorough. The pace of the course is dynamic, but with, with enough time to integrate all the parts. As this was my second iridology course, I was not sure if the course would be an add-on, but it has exceeded my expectations. I've learned lots from the course material and the classes, expanded previous knowledge and gained more confidence. I can see now how this course has helped me to get better answers from my clients and to design effective protocols in very little time. Highly recommended for beginners and advanced. Kimberly Zadalis, she's got more training under her belt. Man, love her to pieces, a little intimidated by her, I gotta tell you. She's got a master's degree in radiology 
And she's got all of these other certifications in Eastern and Western medicine. This is what she said. If you are wondering which iridology course to take, you can stop looking. You found it. Judith is an excellent instructor with many years of experience. She is caring and compassionate, dedicated to the field of iridology and her students. I personally practice both Eastern and Western philosophy medicine and was very impressed with the layout of her pro program. She makes it easy for students to balance life, work, and study. Sharon Bimrose came to me already certified. She had to do iridology as a part of her naturopathy course in Australia. And she said, Judah's course, Confident Nutritionist, I've changed the name since then. Dynamic iridology surpassed my previous training in structure, content, delivery, documentation, and support. Judith taught in a matter that I could understand visually and auditory. Dynamic iridology was well delivered, inspiring and motivating, giving me the much needed structure to the knowledge I had already learned over the years. Dynamic iridology also provided me with the most up-to-date iridology information, along with the added bonus of Judith's extensive experience of holistic health in absolute appreciation. I thank you for making me a better iridologist. All right, so um, just before we show the last slide, do you have any questions that you wrote down while we were doing this that you'd like to put in the chat box? And if you've got questions that you think are, you know, maybe not appropriate for public chat for whatever reason, you are certainly invited to schedule a time to speak with me privately, not as a private consultation, but to answer those general questions, especially about the course, about applying iridology in whatever you do as a practice, whatever your background and the way you work is. And so again, I would encourage you, if you've already got anatomy and physiology under your belt, let's have a conversation. Let's see if this is a good fit for you. And if this is the right time for you to be enrolled. And if it is great, if it's not, we'll, we'll work through things. Alrighty. Now, I don't know if there's any more questions coming in. If anyone's typing a question or has another comment and you're busy typing, just use the hand raise icon so I know, know to wait for you. This is something I would love to get certified in. I'm sure if the timing is appropriate, but maybe a conversation would be clarifying. Tori, yes. Yes. Let's look at this. Let's have a conversation. If this isn't the right time, I can let you know when the next start date is. We can talk about what's going on in your life to see if this is workable or not. Seriously, I had one, one person contact me about the course. She was seven months pregnant and the next course was starting three months from then. She thought she was going to do the course. And I said, listen, I know you're having a cesarean section because there have been some complications with the pregnancy. And this is your first baby. I'm going to tell you up front, this is not the right time for you to, to do this. You know, I want you in the course, but it's not the right time. Right. And she thought about it and she got back to me. She said, you know what? You're right. I don't know what it's like to have a baby. And it's probably, I probably should wait. And she did wait. And so I was very glad she did wait because she needed to focus on her baby and she needed to focus on healing from the cesarean section after she'd had that. Right. So I'm not here to thumb screw anybody into the course. I do hope to speak with most of you. And if I've already spoken with you and this, this presentation tonight has made you think, yeah, now I really want to do it. Just schedule another conversation with me. Use that link and we'll talk again and we'll see how things have shifted for you and see if it's a good fit. Other than that, I, um, I just hope you have a great evening. And I look forward to speaking with you really, really soon. Take good care and happy new year. Bye for now.